All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm delighted to welcome back, uh, welcome back here, John Briggs. And you are where today, John? I'm in Salt Lake City, Utah. Salt Lake City, Utah, absolutely. And John is the author of the book. Uh, it's called Profit First for Micro Gyms, a system for healthy cash flow. And I believe you have another book coming out. Uh, is it later this year or next year, John? Yeah, it'll be later next year. Current working title is called the 80% Capacity Framework. Excellent. And what we're going to talk about today is... Um, so we've heard a lot about the great resignation. We've heard a lot about people going out and starting their own businesses. And and obviously, that's people have always done that. It seems there'll be more and more people are doing it because, let's face it, the, the tools are there to make it very easy for you to set up the, the infrastructure for a business. Now, one interesting thing that we just talked about before we came on air, a very interesting uh, insight that John had is, okay, so... There's a lot of people who are resigning from companies who are kind of starting their own business businesses. Why are they resigning and leaving the companies in the first place? What's driving them to make that decision? And then when they go set up on their own, how do they avoid when they start hiring people that they build an organization that's a mirror image of the one that they just left and then their employees start leaving? So, um, so John, just around around that concept, I, I think that was a great insight and a great a, a great concept. And uh, I, I, do you think that a lot of people f fall into that trap because we're very we're very into muscle memory and we just go, <laughs> oh, this is what I'm used to, so this is what I'll do. Yeah, I wonder if um, in this context, I'd probably call it culture memory. Yeah. Um, but same idea, right? Like you get into this scenario. I, it, so I I'm have an accounting company. And this is definitely dominant mindset in the accounting industry where people get fed up with the big four. They, but those are the largest big four accounting yep. firms. They leave and create their own and then they create a company that's identical to the big four. Well, cause I guess the big four is successful. They make a lot of money. I should just copy that. Congratulations. You've just created the same model that you hated. How long do you think your team is going to last with you? And as, as I'm doing my book and doing research, this exists in the software industry, attorneys. Um, I mean, really, software as a service, any of those companies, you, you think about some of the models where they have these really tight deadlines that are pushed by people who aren't actually doing the work. Mm -hmm. um, so even though we have this scenario after COVID and the great resignation that was following and, you know, are we still in it? No one really knows. We know the last two decades, three decades, four decades has shown that this is what people do. They leave companies and end up creating a company that's pretty darn close to the same one that they didn't like. Uh, and so I think we need to do better. And it's a great opportunity for those of us who've taken that risk and started our own business. We can be a change maker and actually create a company where our team wants to stay and, and uh, different than whatever the other industry companies are offering. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great point. There used to be, I remember we did this exercise a number of times in, in some companies that I was in where we used to sit down and say, okay, if we were going to create a company from scratch right now that was going to take us out, that was going to, you know, um, was going to come up against us, compete with us and take us out, what would we do? And and yet, to your point is, when we do get the opportunity to do that, maybe create it from scratch, we do fall back on on creating what was there before, apart, uh, rather than looking at, okay, what can I do completely differently? What is it? What is it that I didn't like, or customers didn't like about the you know the place that I worked before? What? How can I present things differently? How can I build things differently? Yeah, I mean, I when you were saying that, I was thinking about um, in the book. There's a book called Netflix no rules rules uh really good read written by um the founder of netflix and they share a story about how when they were a smaller company you know they had the opportunity where blockbuster could have bought them out and blockbuster laughed at them because they didn't do what you just said they didn't think through if we were to create a company from scratch they would blow us out of the water and put us out of business what would that company look like well, Netflix existed and they're like, no, these little peons. Um, and now, of course, Netflix is a behemoth and Blockbuster 
is non-existent. Um, so I, yeah, we just, we want to make sure that we're not making that same mistake and we have a great opportunity to just reset things and, and don't do things the way they were. Make a list, you know, what are the things that drove me to leave my company, to start my own mm -hmm. business? Make sure that you have solved the problem to your own pain points. Uh, with my accounting firm, that's what I did when I left uh, the traditional modeled firms. I had I had mm -hmm. experience with Deloitte and two other smaller firms. Um, I identified what really frustrated me as an employee of one of those businesses. And I've made sure that as we grow our company, we aren't doing those things. Yeah. So as um, when you talk to other people like you and 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 yourself and your own experience, so what are some of those things that really do? What are some of the common things that drive people out of a company and the things that they could really address when they build their own? Your team wants to feel heard. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that they want their idea to always be implemented, but they want to feel heard. They want to feel like they have control over what they're doing. Um, and then if we're coming in as the owner or have systems in place or ridiculous project deadlines, um, that doesn't give them a lot of control. And so we, we want to build in systems in a way where they're almost able to take ownership over the deadline because they're part of the decision-making process. Um, and, and that's a lot of what we do. I, I involve my team in a lot of conversations. Uh, even as we get bigger, we currently have 35 team members. It was a lot easier as a smaller team, mm -hmm. uh, but even with 35 team members, we get input from them. We give them heads up, like here are things we're thinking about, here are changes we're thinking about making. So they have a say or can express frustration ahead of time before we make the change. And then because they were able to communicate what they didn't like about what we were suggesting we may do, we could then come back to them and say, well, here's why your perspective is a little off or thank you for your perspective. We've made some tweaks to what we're going to do because we like your idea. Regardless of if it's one of those scenarios, they will feel like they had a part in the decision. And so now you have automatic buy-in from them. Yeah. And I think, and I think one of the advantages that people have nowadays, especially when you're setting up your own small business is that uh, depending on the type of business, clearly, uh, is that you pretty much can hire people from anywhere in the world. Right? Yes. You, you can have a lot of, and you can get the, you can get top skill set people. If, if, if location isn't an issue for you, say it's a program or something, you can get some of the best educated top class people on the other side of the world at a reasonable cost. Um, but, and here's where I think you have an advantage as a small business. If you, if you take advantage of it is integrating all of those people and making them feel part of your organization, even if they're a contractor, even if they're someone else, uh, even if they're not a full-time employee, even if they're in a completely different you know, country or whatever. Uh, because big companies, and they learned this during the pandemic, aren't very good at that. And they're not very good at making people feel included. And they're not very good at communicating when it's in a non-traditional structure. Yeah, absolutely. I think for a lot of these corporations with the structure that led most people to want to resign in the first place, uh, I think they've realized that uh, their method of communication, at least hopefully they have, even the method of communication that they had internally before people had to work remotely wasn't really working. Mm -hmm. um, and they're just, I don't know why, but they don't seem to be adjusting. Because uh, on that note too, I was thinking about the great resignation because I've, I've had team members. So as an accounting firm right now, uh, the job market's tight for everybody. Yeah. I don't want to say we're an exception, but it is super tight for accountants because you have these traditional models where people want to leave the industry altogether and just work for one company. And you have enrollments down because with social media, new college students can hear from existing accountants how much their life sucks because the accounting <laughs> firm sucks. And so we... I have accountants here on my team that, I mean, they're probably getting headhunting calls a couple times a month at this point. Mm. And there's been a few that um, have come to me and said, hey, I got this job offer from another company and I had to step in and, and match what they're doing. But the point I'm trying to make with the great resignation is um, if they didn't love the culture I had here and if they were dissatisfied with their job overall, they would have just accepted the other offer. Yep. Yep. So we're, 
I, I see all these articles about here's how you stop the great resignation. It, it can it doesn't need to be simpler than create a company where people want to stay with you because then they'll communicate with you of what it is. Uh, you know, if it's a simple pay raise versus I'm going to go to this other place, it's unknown how they're going to treat me, but I really like how I'm treated here. So if you can match my salary, I'm going to stay versus, yeah, I'm miserable here. And they're, they're offering me more money over there. The more money plus the unknown <laughs> over there is better than the hellhole that I'm living in here. Yeah, exactly. I was going to say, yeah, it's, um, you know, I'd rather get paid more and be miserable over there than paid less and be miserable right. here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, and I, I, I get it. And I guess that what you just described there in your own company is that people felt comfortable enough to come and have that conversation as opposed to listen i've accepted this job and i'm leaving in two weeks and then you're like scrambling to try and persuade them but once once somebody i always feel like once somebody's done that they're out the door anyway they're one foot out the door their head's out the door so even if you can persuade them to stay it's not always the best thing but in the scenario that you said is when people feel comfortable about approaching this up front and sort of saying hey listen this came up and you know i like it here that, that's that's a that's a different culture to come back to what you mentioned at the beginning, the, the culture saves you there. Yeah. And, and to your point though, there's a bit of an art to it, right? Uh, I sure. have had a team member during this who said, Hey, I'm getting a job offer over here. It's paying me more. And you know, we knew what his performance looked like. And we said, man, that's so awesome. I hope you enjoy your new job and let your higher yeah. pay. Um, but I can say on some of the other ones that have come to me, what I've actually seen, is they actually now feel more loyalty from me. They believe, which I do, that I trust them even more than I did. And they have stepped up and outperformed what they were doing previously just simply by me saying, I, I want to fight to keep you. What will that take? And and so, I mean, it was a win. It's cost me more money, but the return I'm getting on sure. the back end is is better. Well, as you said, we all know how uh, fun recruiting is these days. So, and the cost, <laughs> the, the hidden, even the hidden costs of that are are, are crazy. Yeah. Uh, and and the, the other the other part too is, um, you mentioned this you mentioned this earlier about people you know want to be heard. I think the other part too is people want to be acknowledged, right? They want to be respected sure. and acknowledged. And I and I think that's it. when you're when you're building an organization. I think that's the other thing is you're not just to listen to people, but acknowledge them who, for who they are, for what skills they bring, and just make them make them feel that they're respected. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that we ask our team members, after, so we have a, we hire them, they have a 90 day trial period. And if it works out in their 90 days, then they sign a full fledged employment agreement. At the 90 days, we ask them, how would you like to be acknowledged? Would you like us to say it in a team meeting? Or would you like us to thank you individually? And a lot of them are like, I don't really want, I don't want an attention. Um, but I call BS on that because their behavior yeah. says, I would like a little bit of attention. Yeah, and yeah. it's normal and I'm not going to fault them for it. I would like oh, someone to say, yeah, hey, John, thanks for running a attention. great company. <laughs> Instead of, hey, here's a problem with this and a problem yeah. with that. Uh, and so everybody, regardless of how introverted they are, will appreciate if you acknowledge them in a group setting. I think it's mm -hmm. a critical component that we need to build into our systems as a company that we are regularly acknowledging our team for the good stuff that they're doing. Yeah, and I, and I think the the other part that unfortunately I still see today and have experienced many times over the years is that uh, you know leaders uh, who aren't able to sort of put their ego aside and say, I'm I, in a public setting, like I'm going to give John all the kudos and credit for this project or whatever. I'm not going to sort of include myself or I'm not going to appropriate it or whatever. And I and I feel that there's not enough people do that because they start to feel like, well, if I give too much credit over here, then am I sort of showing that I'm not doing anything? Yeah, I mean, you have that tendency. Um, I, I just find if, if you're generous with your... Um, positivity of what you are acknowledging of people that I feel like that gets minimized. I haven't seen too much of that here with our company. Yeah, no, I'm just saying it's a, it's a tendency that I've seen over the years for some people. And it's amazing that when you do the opposite and when you actually acknowledge people publicly and you leave yourself out of it, 
it's amazing how much more powerful that is and how much more appreciated sometimes appreciative sometimes uh, uh, people are i think i think the other piece about uh, where i think you have got great advantages today as i said if you set up a non traditional business if you actually have conversations with your employees again if your business is is the type of business that you know like a knowledge worker business or whatever where you can have a conversation to say what is the right working uh, environment or structure for you because we saw during the pandemic like some people for the first time were having breakfast with their families they were bringing their kids to school they were doing maybe that's not maybe not everybody was still about that <laughs> but a lot of people were suddenly going wow here are things that are really important uh, and i want to hold on to them so have a conversation with your with um you know your manager the business owner to say I will give you the best work possible if you can help structure my work day in such a way that I can hold on to these things that I think are important. Yeah, I when I think about this great resignation thing and the COVID, which led was kind of the catalyst, right? Because of what you just said, people are finding themselves at home and they're like, you know what? This actually feels good. And like internally, it just feels like the right thing to do. Now I'm questioning my industry and my job that wasn't allowing me to do this under the normal circumstances. Um, I don't know what's going to happen in the future, and I'm I'm not actually a proponent of let's go back to the old ways. Mm -hmm. But the current market, if we are looking to build team, we have got to allow our team to have flexibility. We yeah. have to help them understand that we want them to work to live and not live to work. And, and one of the ways we do that is offer them that flexibility. I think as the successful companies are going to be the ones who figure out how to be results driven versus yeah. input driven, right? Cause butt in a seat, hours clocked in, those are input driven things versus uh, in our like, Oh, we need a hundred returns to go out this week. Okay. If you got those hundred returns done in two days, yeah, sure. Take the next three days off. Uh, yeah. Let's be results driven and let people have some flexibility, I think. Yeah, and, and I th I agree with you. And I think that's the way everybody should should operate. Obviously, you have to have the the metrics in place to measure those results. But I, I think it's a, it's, it is a two way street. So if I say to you, John, listen, here's what will work. Here's what really going to work for me. I want, I want to continue to work at home. I need to, you know, I'll start work at seven, but I need a gap here. And then I need a gap here for these other things. However, in return, um, let's agree, you know, my, my deliverables and let's, and I will, I will over deliver for you. So I think it, it's, I think back to your point earlier, it's about that mutual, it's about coming to a mutual agreement, not a one way, but a mutual agreement. You give me flexibility. Okay. I'll agree with you what what I will do in return, and that's uh, and and I'll earn my flexibility. Yeah, and you said the magic M word metrics. Um, as you, I, we've noticed this as we've moved more remote. It is more important than ever to have those metrics to make sure yeah. that you're getting something out of it. Because it's also a bad business decision to let your team be remote and then you don't track what they do and they yeah. take advantage of you. Um, we don't want team that takes advantage of us. We want teams that do results. So it's important for every position to have those types of metrics that you're tracking. And we track the input metrics um, to your point so that if their result metrics aren't what they should be, we can then help them understand, well, it looks like you didn't get this result because your input metrics are saying, you know, you didn't make enough sales calls or you didn't send out enough emails or you didn't do enough social media posts. In our case, you didn't do enough emails to gather source documents from mm -hmm. clients or things like that. Um, metrics are really important, but uh, if you don't have them, um, you are running the risk of being taken advantage of with the way the work environment is right now. Yeah, absolutely. But then again, if you think about it, people were finding lots of ways to take advantage of being in offices too. <laughs> <laughs> there wasn't the physical presence wasn't any guarantee of uh, of efficiency either. No, I, I, you know, for sure. Um, and studies show, uh, and I'm trying to, I just heard this from an author named Mike McCallowitz. He told me he came across a study that shows uh, people work on average, like actual input, like good work hours, 3.2 hours of a shift or a day. Um, mm -hmm. And so he's you know, looking at what what's this eight hour work model. But I was going to go back. As, 
uh, we interviewed a lady um, probably about eight months ago and she turned initially turned down our job offer and said, I got a much better offer over here. They're going to let me work remote. It's going to be awesome. Two weeks later, she reaches out to me and says, Hey, since I'm working remote for this company, I could do your job too remotely. Well, you, you want two mm. full-time jobs? No, you want two full-time salaries and you don't want to do any work for either of us. I was yeah. like, I don't, I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, that, that's, <laughs> that reminds me of somebody who uh, hired this person one time in DC um, and the person came over, was from some government place, started their job. And then after a week and a half said they didn't like it and went back to their old one. Turned out they'd just taken two weeks vacation. <laughs> they'd never quit. <laughs> they'd never quit their old job. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, there's, so there's lots of ways. There's lots of ways people can, can scam us. But here, um, but John, I think uh, the, the main point, I think, going back to the very beginning of what we, we talked about is don't, if you're going to start your own business, don't take your old old businesses that you worked in as a blueprint like try a little bit of blue sky or blue ocean like thinking like let's go try and create something different and as i said it's always a good exercise to go okay if i was going to take on my old company what would i do differently yeah i agree and i would just say a, an easy way to do that is i would list what did the company do really well was it was something mm -hmm. with sales was the way they sold the marketing okay, then emulate what did well, but the things that gave you heartburn and pain, what's the solution to that? How can you create a company that makes that pain point a pleasure for the team that you plan on hiring? Yeah, no, it's great advice. Uh, all of John's information is going to be below this video, but before we go, John, please do tell people a little bit more about yourself and what you do. Yeah, so we're a CPA firm. We um, do tax strategy, bookkeeping, and cash flow management. Uh, and so if you're interested in some free tax strategy tips, we have a bunch of free resources at insighttax.com backslash wealth. And, uh, you know, check out our blog too. We try to be straight to the point, not too fluffy, just good. This is going to save you money if you do this type of stuff. Fantastic. Again, thanks, John. Thank you for watching and listening. I'll see you all again soon. Thank you.